language with us and she's going to be talking us through um, intervertebral disc disease and um, the management and um, in a conservative and a surgical way um, of this disease or diseases I should say. Um, Claire would you like to introduce yourself? Yes so um, I'm a veterinary neurologist uh, and I work have two jobs I work at um, Fitzpatrick referrals for three days a week and I see clinical cases that includes a high proportion of dogs with intervertebral disc disease because it's one of the most common spinal cord conditions that we see in the dog. And I also am lucky enough to spend the rest of the week at the University of Surrey, where I'm a professor of veterinary neurology there. So I'm lecturing to the vet students there and uh, also doing my own research, which uh, centers a lot around a spinal cord condition called syringomyelia keeping yourself very, very busy. Yes. <laughs> so um, tonight we're going to be doing a bit of a presentation. Um, this is the first time we've done this, um, well, I've done this on uh, Facebook Live. So please bear with me if there's any technical hitches. And obviously we have got a few connectivity issues with um, the, co the COVID issue. So everybody's online at the same time. So uh, bear with us, but I will let um, Claire take it away. So I'm going to disappear for a little while um, and um, looking forward to learning lots from you from about IVDD, Claire. Great. So um, we thought we'd try a mini um, uh, format of a lecture. Um, and that's because I'm quite a visual person. And you can see actually behind me on my dry white board is the remnants of the diagram that I did last time. Uh, that um, uh, I presented on CAM, where it was me trying to draw on a dry whiteboard and, and do it back, uh, backwards. This time I thought I'd, I'd put in a few slides just because I find it so much easier to have uh, a visualization of what I'm talking about. And I thought what we'd first talk about is what is the intervertebral disc? because that is um, a, a source of confusion for many people, especially with the terminology that we use. We often say things like slipped disc. And I think of when something slipped, that something solid has moved from point A to point B. Um, and it's so uh, pressing on the spinal cord or the nerves. Uh, but actually, in actual fact, when we talk about slip disc, it's, it's quite inaccurate. Uh, and we actually usually mean burst or herniated disc. So what does the intervertebral disc look like? And this is a picture that is, um, sorry if you are just having your dinner and you think this is a bit gruesome, especially if you're having a T-bone steak. But this is um, uh, an intervertebral disc of a dog here in cross section. And this is the top part of the disc where my little hand is. And this is where the spinal cord would sit. And then this is uh, the bottom part of the disc. And I like to describe the disc as a bit like a jam donut. It has this outside donut, this fibrous outer uh, uh, donut, and then we have the liquid jelly center. And this liquid jelly center is called the nucleus pulposus, and the outside part is called the annulus fibrosus. And this is it in cross section. So you can see here this red bit is the end of the vertebrae and it's red because that's bone marrow and this is the end of another vertebrae and you remember this is a cross section so it's as if it's gone straight down the center and then we have the annulus fibrosis here and then the liquid jelly center and i think when you look at this you can really appreciate that this is a squidgy center to what is a hard object and this gives the spine flexibility uh, if you didn't have the intervertebral discs, it'd be like having a broom handle stuck up your back. You would, wouldn't be able to move at all. You'd be completely rigid. So the reason why I can do this, which I can demonstrate to you, is because I have intervertebral discs that allow my individual vertebrae to, to move. And to allow this, what you need is this incredibly dynamic structure. And you can see how the ligament here allows the flexibility of the vertebrae, but you need this nucleus pulposa in here um, as a bit of a shock absorber, um, a, as something that can deform under pressure, because otherwise um, then uh, it, it would, the whole thing would be very rigid and, uh, and inflexible. 
Now, of course, what the problem happens is when this jelly bit dehydrates, when it's no longer squidgy. And that happens early in some breeds of dogs, and specifically those dogs breeds that have chondrodystrophism. And chondro means cartilage, so it's basically a cartilage uh, abnormality. And chondrodystrophism is extremely common in dogs because basically it's any dog which is miniaturized uh, compared to the wolf, which is actually a lot of dogs. Uh, and the more chondrodystrophic they are, the more they have short legs, the more um, potentially predisposed they are to it. And of course, man has selectively bred for chondrodystrophic dogs really for millennia. Um, we can certainly see uh, um, um, records uh, in graves of very miniature dogs. Uh, and this is because miniature dogs were bred for control of vermin and also for chasing prey that went to the ground. But nowadays, we don't tend to use them for, for that so commonly, but we do like to have them as a, co a companion. So how does the DAT disc differ from our more regular disc here. Now, I'd like to just point out again before I go to the next slide that this is jelly. It looks like almost water. And in fact, it's 80% water. And just look that this top bit of annulus is really quite thick. And if I show you now, this is what a dachshund looks like. And this jelly now has changed to something that is more like cottage cheese. And if we look at the annulus, at the top here, see how thin it is. So we've got a double whammy here. First of all, we have the problem that this jelly no longer absorbs shock. It is no longer squidgy. And also we have a problem that this disc here is much thinner. So you can imagine a situation that if I was to tear this, then, or if it was to become torn, since I'm not going to actually tear a disc, then it's not much for this disc contents to come out. And of course, what is running along the top here? It's the spinal cord. So once we get a tear in this disc, then these disc contents come out and they press on the spinal cord. Or alternatively, they're extremely irritant and it causes inflammation of the membranes of the spinal cord, the sac that the spinal cord sits in, which we call um, the meninges. So you get a, a mild uh, meningitis. Um, not an infectious meningitis, but an infl inflammation of that membrane, which is extremely painful. And that's why you get those, those pr um, uh, uh, problems of pain and then dysfunction of the spinal cord. So this shows the most common type of disc degeneration that we see in these little chondrodystrophic dogs like our little Dachshund here. So in the normal situation, we have a disc which has this fibrous outer coat and this liquid jelly center. And normally this disc is squidgy. It deforms, it's able to, to um, uh, conform to all the different positions that you want to naturally put your spine in. But in the chondrodystrophic dog, it de degenerates. And then this thin portion here, most commonly because this bit is thicker. So if bit, some bit's going to go, it's going to be the top. And then the disc contents come out. So it's no, not so much a, um, a, a slip disc, but a burst disc. And that's quite important for understanding how to manage it because many people naturally assume that if you've got a slip disc and it's slipped from point A to point B, that I could push it back in from point B to point A, but you can't. This doesn't go back. It would be a bit like trying to, to squeeze back sun uh, suntan lotion or toothpaste back into a tube. It just it doesn't go back because the hole is not able to take it and it's not uh, uh, having a function anyway. So we have to distinguish that uh, to the other type of disc disease that we see. And these are in what we call uh, non dechondrodystrophic dogs. So these are things like your Labrador uh, and your other bigger breeds um, that don't have any degree of dwarfism. And this is much more typical uh, of disc degeneration that humans have. And so in this, 
you just get some aging degeneration and dehydration of the disc that's associated with wear and tear. And so many things will influence that. Genetics may influence it, but actually age is probably the biggest influencer and also the pressure that's put on that disc. For example, if this dog, this Labrador here, had a degree of stifle disease, had a degree of knee disease, it would tend to throw its weight forward and that might put um, more, um, more pressure on the, um, on the uh, uh, spine and result in more problems. Oh dear, the picture's gone. Um, just see if we can get rid of that. This is the problems of uh, technology. Okay, so our next type of disc that we can see is um, in the dogs which don't have surgical disc disease and we tend to categorize as a type three extrusion. Um, and these are dogs where there isn't actually um, uh, so I'm going to take it back one bit because we lost the screen, I realized, and, um, uh, and uh, I didn't quite explain. So in the uh, type 2 disc retrusion, we get dehydration of the nucleus pulposa. That is the dehydration of the, of the donut. And what happens is that dehydrated um, uh, uh, disc gets uh, pushed into the outer layers of the donut and the whole donut bulges. So rather than a burst disc, you have a protruded disc that is pressing on the nerve roots. Our next type of disc disease is this one that's showing on your screen now. This is a, a very acute onset non-surgical disc disease um, and it, um, uh, it is uh, characterized by a very sudden onset paralysis and it occurs in very active dogs that are suddenly exercising. And uh, um, when I'm talking about these, I'm including a number of different um, diseases that we sort of all group together. And the reason for that is they're all relatively similar. So we can call them uh, a hydrated nuclear pulposus extrusion. So that's when the jelly bursts out, but it's normal jelly. So because it's mostly water, it um, doesn't form much compression of the spinal cord. And then we have a high velocity, low volume disc extrusion. And the way I describe this is it's a little bit like um, a bullet. Now, if I had a bullet in my hand um, and I threw it up and caught the bullet, then it wouldn't traumatize my hand. It's small, it's little, uh, and it's not doing much damage. But if I fired that bullet from a high velocity rifle, then that small object could take away my hand and my arm. And that's what happens with these high volume, um, uh, 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 low volume disc extrusions um, because they are um, uh, uh, very small objects but fired off into the spinal cord at very high uh, velocity uh, and do a lot of damage. They impact the spinal cord. So your typical scenario is your um, uh, your your uh, uh, dog, like uh, this very active dog here that's catching a ball, leaping up and catching a ball, yelping, and then suddenly becoming paralyzed. And the, the difference with these particular ones is that there is no surgical management for them. So um, uh, you can only do physiotherapy. And the final type of uh, scenario is your fibrocarpal adenosine embolism, which is very similar. Um, but uh, is um, uh, where a very small amount of disc material manages to uh, go into the blood supply to the spinal cord and, and, uh, uh, and cuts it off. 
Uh, and so you get literally an infarct to the spinal cord. So three types of disc disease, but very, very similar. And it's actually quite difficult to tell the difference on an MRI scan. And actually in all of them, the only way you can confirm which one it was is to do a post-mortem on the dog, which I think the dog would object to doing um, uh, as that's somewhat the ultimate, but rather uh, distressing diagnostic test. And so in this particular image that's showing now is, is um, one that is showing that um, uh, acute non-compressive uh, nucleus pulposus extrusion or a high velocity, low volume disc. And what you can see is that red arrow is pointing to something white. Uh, and there's many of those white things uh, going along the, uh, in a straight line. Those white things are, are the, the centers of the disc, the jelly, the nucleus pulposa in the disc. And you can see with the one that the arrow is pointing to, it looks slightly different, but only very slightly. In fact, there's one, two disc space down look, looks more different. But I can tell you in that one, it looks slightly less volume. And just above it is a little black uh, divot. Um, and that shows that there's something going on at that spinal canal. And when we look at the spinal cord in cross section, what we can see uh, in the other image is that um, blue arrow is pointing to white in the spinal cord. And that is a bruise in the spinal cord, a contusion in the spinal cord. Uh, and it shows you that there isn't anything compressing the spinal cord, but it is damaged. Um, and so there isn't anything you can do surgically. Um, the only thing you can do is, is to manage that uh, condition. So um, what we want to talk about now is the uh, different ways of managing uh, the, uh, c the um, spinal cord injury, which depends a lot upon how bad the spinal cord injury is. And this grading system is very much used by neurologists and vets to communicate with each other. So grade one, you can see, is an animal which is painful. Grade two is an animal that is still walking, but weak, so dragging their legs. Grade three is an animal that is no longer able to walk. Um, so they're either so weak they can't stand up or make any meaningful movement, or they're completely paraplegic. Grade four is a dog that has lost um, the their ability to urinate, so-called neurogenic bladder. And grade five is the worst of all. This is a dog which is paraplegic, has a neurogenic bladder, and uh, has lost all sensation of pain, which means that when you pinch the toenails, they're not able to, um, to feel them. And that is uh, a condition which is a poor prognosis. And really, if anything surgically can be done, then it should be done because the prognosis uh, with surgery raises from less than 5% to uh, greater than, um, well, about 50%. However, that really only applies to intervertebral disc disease. If you're dealing with a spinal cord fracture, um, a road traffic accident, then the, the prognosis is, is, is hopeless. So how do we manage these particular uh, problems? When do you refer? Well, actually, if you take everything up until um, a grade five, then you um, uh, can have success with non-surgical management. And so if, uh, if finance is an issue, which of course it is, especially in, uh, in, in our, the situation we have at the moment, then you may get success with non-surgical management. And really, actually, when you look at the papers, that success is up to about 80%. So it is worth pursuing. However, it, it's fair to say that, um, that the, the greater the grade, so for example, a grade four dog, then the less chance that they're going to have with, with um, non-surgical treatment and, um, and the longer they're going to take to recover. So if there is an option, really with grade three to five, it would be better to manage uh, surgically if that's a, a, a good option or at least uh, assess the dog for that. I've put there a question mark, radiographs or taking x-ray pictures. Um, and there is pros and cons to that. The, uh, the con is, um, or the, the disadvantage, is that radiographs are actually pretty expensive. And to get a good spinal radiograph, you really have to either very heavily sedate or anesthetize the dog because the positioning is such 
that no dog that is conscious would just lay there. Um, you really have to stretch the dog um, to get a good position. Um, and so um, that and taking uh, a few good quality radiographs uh, or x-ray pictures would really set you back several hundred pounds, e even if the, the vet was being quite generous. And the trouble with taking x-ray pictures is they're not uh, conclusive. And so though they in some instances can be highly suggestive that you've got a disc problem, um, they're not enough to do surgery on. And so sometimes your vet will advise you, yes, well, let's get x-rays because um, if it's suggestive, then, um, uh, then we will um, want to refer. But sometimes they'll say, well, actually, because I think clinically that it's a very good chance that you need to have surgery, we won't get x-rays because that might increase the expense that you're going to have. And unfortunately, surgical management is always going to be uh, an expensive procedure. So how do we manage uh, non-surgical disc disease? Um, and uh, um, the uh, main uh, i was actually going to say uh, maybe i could go back to that uh, that flow chart esme that would be uh, that would be great um the main thing is that we have to restrict their activity and that's the difficult thing to do uh, i've got that little picture there of the dog looking sad in a cage and unfortunately that's really what we're talking about because the we go back to our uh, uh, image of what a disc look like um the disc is a disc extrusion is where you have a hole in that fibrous, annulus fibrosis. And what we want to do um, is to stop more disc material coming out of that hole. And uh, the, the, if, if your dog is feeling fantastic and wanting to jump up for a ball and jump up for the postman, and let's face it, if you want to have a dachshund, that's what they're going to want to do is to jump up when the postman comes. Um, it, then you, that more of that disc material is going to squeeze out of that hole in the annulus fibrosis. Um, and so we have to restrict the dogs. And we also have to provide pain relief uh, because that would be unethical not to and, and, and really a, a, a real welfare for, problem for the dog. Um, and so that's another reason why we have to restrict because if we, if we, if we provide some analgesia for the dog, then they're going to feel fantastic and want to jump up for the, for the, um, for the postman. So we really have to restrict these dogs. And that means uh, leash walks only to just do their business out in the garden and nothing else. And cage rest or equivalent. So cordoning off a non-slip area of your, of, of, your, of your house. And that's why I actually advocate that it's a good idea to train your dog to comfortably go into a crate uh, because you never know uh, when you might need to restrict your dog. Now, hopefully after two weeks of this, and believe you, it's uh, agonizing two weeks. I've had to do it myself with my own dog. And, um, and that was a very painful period for me because the dog was uh, driving me nuts. Um, but hopefully after that, will get an improvement and we can continue that for a further two weeks, perhaps perhaps increasing the walks to about 10 minutes, um, five to 10 minutes, and hopefully we'll then continue to improve and then we can gradually return to normal function over usually the next four weeks. And the way I normally do that is by saying increase the length of the walk by five minutes per week. So it goes from 10 minutes to 15 minutes to 20 minutes, you get the picture. However, if during this time there is no improvement, you really have to consider surgery because, frankly, there should be improvement. Uh, if, the, if the disease is down to swelling of the spinal cord um, or irritation of the meninges causing pain, if there isn't an improvement, it suggests there's a great big old lump of disc material underneath that spinal cord. Uh, and that's not uh, going to improve because of the volume of material. So you certainly should consider surgery. You should also consider surgery if there is a deterioration at any point, because again, that means that probably more disc material has squeezed out through that hole in the annulus 
And so what was a small compression is now maybe a bigger compression. And sometimes when you do surgery on those dogs, you can see an onion layers of disc extrusions. Uh, and it can be amazing how the dog with that very slow onion layers of disc extrusions can actually still be still be walking. So you think the dog is is stable um, and still a grade two, but actually it, the disc uh, extrusion has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Thanks. Can I have the next uh, uh, next slide, please? So. With our non-surgical management, it's indicated for our low grades, our grades one to two, but we may have success uh, up to grade four. But grade five really is a surgical emergency. You can try um, uh, uh, non-surgical uh, management if you have no money. There, there will be cases that improve. There's always those anecdotal cases. But in those instances, you really have to consider the most important thing, and that is bladder management, which I'm not going to go into uh, in this talk because it's really aimed at, uh, at our owners. But in those instances, those dogs, they can't urinate and their bladder is like this, a great big old balloon uh, with it dribbling out on top of it. And, uh, and, the, and the bladder, you can think of the muscles as being, as being like this. They're interconnected. And if you overstretch that bladder, those interconnections between those muscle fibers are lost. And that, that dog will never urinate again normally because the bladder has been permanently damaged. And so those grade five cases are still expensive because they often need to have veterinary help to, to express the bladder because that's not something that is easily learned. So obviously the big advantage of non-surgical management for disc disease is it's pretty inexpensive. It doesn't require uh, specialized expertise or equipment. The disadvantage is there's much higher rate of recurrence um, and deterioration and much higher chance that you may have persistent deficits. And also there's a bit of a problem because you're not actually doing any diagnostic tests. And, and, and what if it wasn't a disc disease? What if it was a tumor? Then you're really delaying getting uh, adequate treatment for the dog. Now, the way I'm talking here is really for that type 1 disc disease, where you have the toothpaste-like dis disc degeneration coming out. It's not really applicable to the same extent for your type 2 disc disease, for your lumbar sacral discs. Um, and um, really, that's the subject of a, a, a different CAM Facebook Live, which I know Hannah will be enthusiastic about because she'll she'll want me to come back and talk about that separately. Um, but really, with those dogs, they're much less likely to go to surgery early. And that's because a lot of them, like human disc disease, if you imagine if we if we operated on every human who had back pain, their NHS would be overwhelmed, much like they are now, uh, and it would be unnecessary. Um, so many of the dogs with type 2 disc disease will respond to rest and, and moderate exercise. And we normally give them about six, six weeks um, uh, worth of, uh, of rest before making a decision for surgery. So um, I think I've got one or two slides more. So when do I do... Um, uh, um, so for non-surgical management, um, the most important thing we're doing is restricting their movement. And they heal by uh, a natural process. So people always say, well, does the disc go back in? Or what happens to the disc? Well, in actual fact, what happens to the disc is the body tries to wall it off. It tries to get rid of it. And if you were to do a post-mortem on a dog with a mild disc extrusion, you'd see a little bump over the, over the disc walled off. And that walling off also makes it less irritant. And it's the body's natural he healing process which repairs that damaged spinal cord. And whether that occurs or not, depends on how badly damaged the spinal cord is. So we must give them analgesia. And the most common ones that I will use will be non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, and I usually combine that with something else. And that would be typically a gabapentinoid, like gabapentin or possibly pregabalin. And of course, the hospitalized dog, you might use opioids. Uh, before anybody asks, I don't use tramadol in dogs. Um, I might use it in cats. In tramad in tramadol in dogs is notoriously unreliable um, and, uh, uh, and uh, less likely to result in good pain relief. Uh, and um, 
The other thing that I don't use is corticosteroids. Um, there have been numerous studies on corticosteroids, and although they will reduce spinal cord swelling, they will also interfere with, he uh, with healing um, and, um, and will uh, um, increase the chance of adverse effects such as gut perforation or ulceration, really nasty things. There, I say there's always exceptions. And I will use uh, locally delivered corticosteroids in the form of epidural steroids in, in lumbar sacral disc disease. And they're just rare cases such as wobbler's syndrome. Um, and, um, uh, and when there's really bad nerve root uh, uh, irritation, that I will use it. But on the whole, for your routine case of, of spinal cord disease, I will not be uh, prescribing prednisolone or dexamethasone. Um, and as I've said before, exercise restriction is crate restriction, confining to a small area, carry or walk out to urinate and defecate only, no stairs and no jumping. Um, so that means if your dog is sleeping on your bed, well, uh, I, I, I can understand why you'd want to have the dog sleeping on the bed. Many people do. But you're going to have to find a way of solving that problem because if your dog jumps off the bed, then they are at risk of injury. Uh, and um, I don't know whether or not you'll be able to carry your dog upstairs or not. May I have the next slide, please? So when do we do surgery? Well, as I've said before, grade five, um, but unfortunately, if we're talking about a dog which has uh, had a road traffic accident, then we will uh, not recommend uh, that those dogs are, uh, um, have surgery because we know from sad experience that they don't get better. Um, grades three to four, they generally recover more quickly and with less residual deficits and pain. And actually, when we're talking cost, it can be actually sometimes cheaper to do surgery than to have the dog in the hospital for, for weeks and weeks. Um, grade two, one to two, it's actually worth it. Um, uh, it trying conservative management. Um, however, some people like us to get a diagnosis for uh, reasons that I've stated before, to rule out the nasties. And if the uh, imaging shows there's a big old spinal cord compression there, as it might, might do, then those ones um, we think, well, it's better that they be managed surgically because it's likely they'll always have a problem. So we also need to think about physiotherapy, though, um, because really the more inactive we have these dogs sitting in crates then that will result in muscle contracture and decrease um, joint movement and one of the advantages of doing surgery is that you can implement uh, physiotherapy much sooner uh, and i'm so lucky where i live because uh, sorry where, where i live i'm lucky where i live but i'm oh, much more lucky where i work um, because where i work we have physiotherapists that are uh, um, uh, that attend our morning rounds and we literally transfer our, 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 our surgical patients too. So the dog will uh, have surgery on one day and in uh, morning rounds I'll transfer the care uh, to the physiotherapy department. Of course, um, the dog's also been cared for by our nurses and our vets. Um, and they will implement a cage side uh, physiotherapy program and then usually uh, are involved with the discharge of that animal so that the owner is going home with instructions. And then they'll transfer to a local physiotherapist as necessary. So you can see the different types of physiotherapy that are being employed here. One of the um, most important things is just walking the dog with support, um, uh, as you can see in the top most corner um, with the, what we call them space pants or silver pants on to help support the dog in a normal position. Um, you can see some more advanced physiotherapy there wh where we're making the dog um, balance. Now, we don't make the dog start off balancing on a little wobble cushion like that or a wobble board, as you can see there. We'll start with what we call leg lifts, just gently lifting the leg. Um, it's called pointer uh, in Pilates or yoga if you're, if you're doing that yourself. So lifting the leg, making sure they keep the, the, the spine level. And of course, they, they won't do that to start with. It's something they learn how to um, uh, learn how to do. And that will graduate into the Superman lift where they have one uh, limb going forward like that and one limb going going backwards. Um, and, it, and it's really worthwhile um, hooking up with a physiotherapist 
uh, because they will um, certainly help get the dog mobile more quickly in my experience. Um, especially if the dog, dog is very inactive. And really, um, uh, I think the physiotherapy doesn't have to be too onerous. I, I, I say to people, well, really, if you can spend the time for the opening uh, credits to your favorite program, so five minutes, um, uh, then, uh, uh, then uh, it'd be something that you do in, in the evening uh, whilst you're relaxing, whilst you're watching your favorite program, then, it, it, then it's not too not too difficult or whilst listening to your favorite uh, piece of music. So when do we do surgery? Well, if, it's de if you're deteriorating neurological status, um, uh, if they have spinal pain, which is not controlled with analgesia, so if it's unrelenting despite having decent analgesia or it recurs as soon as you try to reduce the dose, uh, dose of drugs, or if those neurological deficits are not improving, and we typically reassess them on a weekly basis. Um, and uh, um, well, how do we do surgery? And I apologize for the slightly gruesome image here. Uh, the most common type of disc surgery do is something called a hemilaminectomy. And the hemi refers to going in from the side and the laminectomy refers to where you go through you go through the lamina. And I, I've drawn a little cartoon on the side there, which shows um, uh, the approach. And you can see the yellow is the spinal cord and the blue is the, uh, is the disc material that is underneath the, the, the spinal cord. Um, and over on the other side there, where all the blood is, um, you can see uh, what that looks like in real life. And the white, well, in the distance, approximately the same position as the yellow is the spinal cord and the sort of glistening white that is more to the um, uh, to the right of the image is the disc material underneath the spinal canal now actually um actually making a hole through a vertebrae into the spinal canal is not technically difficult um you know i i i could train many people could to do it but knowing what to do when you get there is technically difficult and you definitely need a lot of training. And ideally that training should be provided in a residency program where you have, um, which is typically three years, where you have the ability to call on somebody more um, uh, senior to help you out if you get into trouble um, or if you can't find the disc. So the most problem, uh, uh, usual reason for calling someone is you can't find the material, it's well under the spinal cord. And so also they, they can learn from your expertise because uh, obviously making a hole is, uh, is technically easy, but it's also technically easy to really damage the spinal cord. And so that's why only a, a minority of vets are able to offer spinal surgery and how in many instances you will have to be sent to somebody distant um, who's able to do that, just as I would have to send to somebody distant if I wanted to have a dog have the heart of that evaluated because believe you me, I've not kept up to date with my cardiology very well and you would want to have somebody else's opinion. All vets are, are, are specialists to, to some degree, even um, vets in general practice. They are specialized in knowing an awful lot about many different things. So that's the, the, the disc surgery. And going back to our jam donut analogy, you have to imagine that the jam is spilled out from the donut and we have to scoop out the jam. One doesn't push the jam back into the donut. And um, there's two uh, ways of uh, extrapolating this met metaphor. First of all, if I leave the jam out on the table for a long time, it's going to get very hard and dried out and make a much more difficult surgery. And so um, that is why if you're making a decision for surgery, it's better to, um, to do it sooner rather than later. Otherwise, you are quite literally chipping at a hard object underneath a very soft object, which is the spinal cord. And that soft object does not appreciate being hacked at. Um, so uh, you're much more likely to have problems. The other bit of the analogy is that what happens? You know, people are saying, is it bone on bone? You know, what happens when, the, when that jam from that donut is gone? Well, the reality is the dog won't do limbo dancing at that, uh, at that vertebrae, but we wouldn't want him to do limbo dancing. And it's fine. It's just that the, the donut is still there. Um, it's just that that individual joint will not be as flexible um, uh, uh, as, uh, uh, as it used to be. Uh, and I think I have one more picture. Do I have one more picture? 
I think that's all of the slides. Oh, there. That's it. oh good. Well, I'm going to uh, 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 leave myself open to questions then uh, and leave it on that picture. Oh, no, no, it's back on me. It's, I'm coming to join you. <laughs> um, I've got a few questions and then we'll go through some of the uh, questions that have been cropping up. Um, I wanted to go back to talking about um, chondrodystrophic breeds. Um, and we've talked a little bit about it being a genetic um, issue. Is there some environmental issues that also affect the likelihood of getting the disease? That's a very good question. Yes, I mean, for some some uh, uh, breeds of dogs, it's um, uh, homo they're homozygous, meaning they have two copies for the genes that make susceptibility. Um, and uh, but there are things that uh, that you can do. First of all. Uh, I would commend anybody that is wanting to buy a, a susceptible breed, particularly a Dachshund, mm. to visit the Dachshund Health uh, website because it gives you a lot of information there. And dedicated Dachshund breeders are actually arranging for those their breeding dogs to have x-ray pictures taken of their spine to show if they have calcified discs. And in in, in in Scandinavian countries, they've done quite a few studies that have shown that if you breed from dogs with less of these calcified, and by calcified, I mean those, those discs with the white center, those are calcified. If you breed with dogs with less of those calcified discs, then, then um, there's less chance of the dogs having disc disease. And as a general re rule, the lower and the longer you go, the more risk that you have of disc disease. So mm -hmm. the other thing is to perhaps look at some uh, Dachshund type uh, of dogs or other types of dogs that are, they've got longer legs because really the, the, the lower that little tummy is to the ground, the greater the risk uh, would be. And um, um, talking about activity levels, yeah. uh, that's a good question. Uh, because uh, it should be said that there haven't been incredibly robust and huge studies. But probably the best study that has been done um, has been by the uh, Dachshund community. And perhaps it was contrary to what many people would think, uh, or maybe not, that, that generally dogs that were active had less chance of having disc disease. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually makes logical sense, that if your, your dog is fit, and trim um, uh, uh, and uh, doing a sustained level of exercise that they're actually less chance of disc disease because that core muscle strength will help protect uh, that spine. And less um, and so, so I actually don't say um, no stairs, no. Yeah. Um, uh, although I, I, I have to admit, it does worry me when I see Dachshunds jumping three times their height. But I think it is much better that they do that and have an active lifestyle than be fat. Um, yeah. There's also been evidence that uh, that have shown that um, early neutering may increase the risk of, of disc disease. I'm sorry um, for saying that. It's a bit controversial. There's lots of reasons why you may early neuter. Um, but for joint development, there is reasons why early neutering is maybe a bad thing to do because, um, or at least early neutering before joint plates have, have closed. And maybe that early neutering is also to do, it, do with weight gain. The other thing I would say is that I see an awful lot of, uh, of dogs presenting after holidays. And I think that it's unproven, but I think this is because they're suddenly going on long walks or they're suddenly going on challenging walks. If you make a poor little dachshund jump through the heather whilst you go on your nice ramble across Cornwall, then you have to think that is pretty sustained activity for that dog. And so I also think you have to be a bit cautious before suddenly making an unfit dog do a 10 mile hike yeah. just as you would say the same yourself if you go for a half marathon and you've not trained for it you are going to suffer afterwards yes absolutely. Absolutely. um so that's brilliant thank you i think um if it's okay with you we'll go through some of the questions that we've got um here so uh lindsay ross she says hi claire if it's possible could i ask a question i've got a little whippet girl who will be nine in may last september and january she had mris and ops to remove a disc from the bottom of her spine then a slipped disc and two dehydrated from her neck no spaces were put in is this normal um, yes, that, that would be relatively normal. 
um, I say relatively normal. Uh, the it, whether or not you put in an implant into uh, uh, into the disc space really depends on the nature of the uh, of the compression, and it's um, much more likely that in a little dog that you can get away without putting an implant in. And um, believe me, you you actually want to get away without putting an implant in. Implanted surgeries are more expensive and they have uh, overall a higher complication rate because the, uh, the implants can uh, have problems. Um, uh, so really the dogs that have implanted surgeries where you put spaces in are ones where the MRI picture has shown us that there is considerable compression of the foramen, which is the little holes where the nerve root comes in, um, or uh, in, in dogs with specific conditions such as, as wobbler syndrome or large breed dogs with lumbar sacral stenosis, lumbar sacral disease. If, um, if you're doing a surgery where you're trying to remove a compression from underneath the spinal cord, then, uh, and especially in whippet with cervical disc disease, then it's likely you can make a, a hole through that disc and just pull that disc material out and you won't need to put a spacer in. Brilliant. Um, so we've also got a question um, from, let me just find the lady's name, from Rebecca, just asking how we distinguish type 1 versus type 2 um, without imaging. Uh, really will probably be on, on signalment, uh, which basically means breed, age and presentation. Uh, if it's a dachshund, it's highly likely to be type 1. Uh, if it's a Labrador, it's much more likely to be type 2. I think you can also um, uh, tell by uh, acuteness or how quickly the condition occurred because actually type 2 dis disc disease can occur in some large breed dogs, especially German Shepherds. Um, but uh, in type 1 disc disease, it's a tear and an extrusion. And so you get this very sudden onset history, whereas type 2 disease um, it comes on a lot more slowly and may not be associated with spinal cord pain uh, if, if, the, if, if it's just the spinal cord that are being compressed rather than the nerve roots. And I suppose the dogs that we see with the uh, multiple site type 2 disc uh, protrusions, apart from the Labrador or Staffordshire Bull Terriers, they seem to be particularly good at, at getting multiple disc protrusions uh, as an older dog. Yeah. Um, we've got um, Charlotte's asking about um, pet strollers um, for recovering dachshunds which have large airfield tyres and um, the dogs are secured with safety straps to a harness. Um, we consider them safe to use during recovery provided they're used on smooth terrain and always supervised. Is it safe to use them immediately? I assume that means immediately post-surgery. Hi Charlotte. Um... Well, I'm, I'm not too sure what you mean by a st stroller. Do you mean the push chairs that you put in? Um, well, uh, yes. Um, I think that, uh, that, that, that strollers can be very useful for allowing a dog with, with very limited mobility to have some quality of life uh, and save your back. Um, uh, not so much Dachshunds, but I'm thinking... Um, well, the classic one would be uh, uh, Cavalier with, with uh, Chiari-associated pain where they like to do a bit of exercise but might get tired quickly and need a rest. So they're the, they're the dogs that I see in strollers the most commonly, ones that can have a little bit of activity. So I think that's fine. Um, I think that my worry would be that uh, if a dog felt very well, they would just try to jump down from, from that. Um, and uh, it depends on, on, on whether the dog is, is happy in that environment, really, whether it was the dog was benefiting from it or whether they were just thinking, gosh, I wish I was downstairs and had a walk. Yeah. And um, kind of further on from that, do you think training early in life, so starting with ramps and um, you know, particularly in the type one disease here, but um, ramps and um, not letting them jump down and all those sorts of training things are important to start from day one? I certainly, as I said before, think it is important to train your dog to be happy to go into a crate because if you ever have to crate them, 
they will and they don't understand why that's happening or if it's used as some sort of punishment um, and they're not comfortable with it then that you and they are going to have the most miserable time so i certainly think that um that crate training um it, it is a very useful thing because you even if you have a dog that's not predisposed to um to disc disease if they rupture a cruciate you may be asked to create rest your the, the, the dog mm -hmm. um and as far as ramps go um yes um i think that it's much easier to do it sooner rather than than later uh, and uh, maybe you can in, employ that as part of a, a, a um a agility um, or to find, think of other ways in which you can get a dog into, uh, into a car should you not be able to lift it. Um, mm -hmm. I think you have to ask your question, my dog can jump into my high vehicle car now, what happens when it's an older dog? And if the answer is, I can't lift it, then you need to, st uh, uh, then you need to or you can't put it in any other way, then you need to start training them how to get up a ramp. Yes. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, I'm just having a little look through, see if there's any more. Um, Karen has asked whether, um, so at this point in time with coronavirus going on, um, where they can't do hydro, physio and acupuncture, how is it best to manage um, IVDD dogs at home? Well, I think a lot of physiotherapists will, um, uh, that if you've been going to a regular physiotherapist, they will give you exercises that you can do at home. Um, and so uh, I, it's not much uh, help if you don't have a physiotherapist, but it may be that your vet is connected with one um, and, uh, and that physiotherapist um, might um, be able to give exercises for that dog. I mean, for example, our, our physiotherapy um, and hydrotherapy clinic is, of course, cl closed with the situation we are in at the moment, but they are seeing uh, they are available for our inpatients because that's part of our care. And so the physiotherapist will be giving the patients uh, that we have an instruction uh, page with with um, with pictures. Uh, and I'm sure there are also online resources which um, which show you how to do those sorts of exercises. I'm sure CAM has lots of those resources on their websites that people can 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 look at. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out, I thought useful just um, reiterating what you'd said about neutering. Ian's just said that the study, um, the survey in 2015 showed that um, the odds of a neutered Dachshund suffering IVDD over the age of three is nearly double that of an entire Dachshund. So it's the in, um, useful data to know and definitely useful as a, as a Daxi owner to know whether or not to, to neuter, definitely. Um, let's have a look. Um, so we've got a worried mum here. Um, my beagle has possible cervical disc disease. He had neck pain and stiff neck and has been on gabapentin and Inflacam. This was last Wednesday. He could walk and toilet. He can now move his neck more freely, isn't showing pain. I've put him on crate rest and restricted exercise. My vet thinks a nerve issue summer, but without a specialist, we won't know for sure. I have insurance, but it won't cover all the costs. So I'm trying this method first. There is slight left poor drag, but it's very intermittent and not happening often. This all started being furloughed. He would usually be asleep all day in bed and being home, he was very active and going on a walk. Also, does it sound like he should make a good recovery with the signs improving after one week? Yes. First of all, I would ask the question is how old is your beagle? Um, because beagles are very predisposed to getting cervical disc disease, but it tends to happen in beagles that are more than two years of age. So if the beagle is less than two years of age, then um, I'd have to worry that it had something else uh, going on. Um, and that might be worth doing some limited tests. But you are where you are now, and it sounds like that's in a good place. Yeah. It certainly sounds like um, your beagle has responded to non-surgical management uh, and the question is uh, following that little uh, little flow chart is whether you can re uh, uh, ultimately remove that painkiller so I wouldn't re uh, uh, recommend that you do so now but if in, in um, uh, a, a couple of weeks time depending on how long he's been the last Wednesday so you he would want to be on at least two weeks worth of painkillers probably headed towards four weeks in all, maybe a reduced dose. But if you cannot withdraw those painkillers without the pain coming back, 
um, uh, after about the two week period, then it does suggest that he has um, an ongoing compression of his spinal cord. And, and it is um, more likely to be this disease if it's an older beagle. And we've got Kaz here just asking whether the way the dog sits can um, make it more susceptible to disc problems. Hi, Kaz. Um, well, that's a very good question. Um, and the answer is probably um, uh, sort of hedging my bets. Certainly, uh, as I said before, if an animal has, um, uh, it's more really when they walk, if they have something like the stifle or knee disease, then they throw their weight forward. And that throwing their weight forward can put more pressure. And it would be pretty usual to see more wear and tear on the lumbar sacral joints. Yeah. And certainly when we are doing our physiotherapy um, uh, post spinal injury, one of the things that we do is what we call a tidy sit or what the physiotherapists do is a tidy sit. Now a tidy sit is essentially a squat. Um, so if you imagine yourself doing a squat, so I'm not going to demonstrate it here um, uh, because that would be far too embarrassing. But if you imagine yourself squatting or sitting down towards a chair, but without a chair being there, then that actually requires quite a lot of quadriceps uh, action uh, and gluteal butt action going on. If your dog is weak, they may sleep, sit in a sloppy way with their legs out to one side. So one way to help improve their limb strength is to teach them uh, um, how to do a tidy sit. So that may, that's fairly easy. Uh, most dogs will learn that fairly quickly that they, when they sit and they sit in a nice tidy manner with their, their knees pointing straight forwards, um, then they get a reward. And when they sit with their legs all akimbo, um, they don't get a reward. But obviously that has to be changed for the individual dog because the dog with, with stifle disease, with knee disease, especially cruciate disease, will tend to sit with one knee out to one side. Um, and, I, and apart from the lumbar sacral pressure, I've not seen them particularly have a, have a problem with sitting in, in that way with, uh, with uh, cruciate disease. Um, Matt is saying that their Dachshund had surgery nearly a year ago and is still having difficulty walking properly. He drags, drags his left leg sometimes. Is there a time limit for seeing improvement after spinal surgery in Dachshund? Also, is he at greater risk of recurrence after having it once? There's two questions there. Hi, Matt. Um, well, some dogs um, are left with residual uh, neurological deficits because of the damage to the spine. So it's not so much the, whether the surgery cures them. The surgery provides the best conditions for the spinal cord to recover by removing the compression. But in some instances, the, the spinal cord has been damaged permanently. Um, and so it's pretty common for the grades three and above. Um, so a dog which was paralyzed. Um, to be left with some subtle weakness on their uh, one or both of their back legs. Um, and so um, once you get to a year past surgery, then no, the, there is unlikely to be any more recovery after that. That will represent permanent damage. Typically, the majority of the improvement occurs within three months of surgery. And then you get a little bit of extra improvement probably post that. I've seen some improvement continue to a year, but really that's or the exceptional cases. It is worth in those instances though continuing the physiotherapy because I've definitely some, seen some uh, cases where uh, people have done a lot of nice and, and good intensive physiotherapy including treadmill hydrotherapy um, and then they've, they've stopped because let's face it, it's an ongoing hassle and expense. And then the dog has, has dropped off in their ability. So if you can keep it going, just even with the exercises that take five minutes a day, you can improve that proprioceptive function in those legs. And proprioception is their ability to know where their feet are in space. And when you lose that, that sense of knowing where their feet are in space, that's when they have the tendency to drag. So one thing I would say to you is, is keep up that, well, those work, that those tidy sits those limb lifts and those supermans. Uh, and if you don't know what those are, those are then maybe uh, Google them, look on CAM, um, uh, uh, or hit up with a, a physiotherapist when this, is, this lockdown is all over. Risk, risk of recurrence. Um, yes, once you've had one, one uh, uh, slip disc, then if you're a dachshund, you probably stand about a one in five chance of it happening again. Mm -hmm. um, 
sometimes your neurologist or whoever did the spinal surgery can tell you how likely that is um, because sometimes you can see how many other calcified discs there are and if you can see that every other disc in the spine is having a problem then the chance is much more likely compared to one dog that might have only one calcified disc. So the answer is yes, if he's had it once, no matter what, he's, he's at more, more at risk of having it, having it again. But in his individual case, that, that you may be able to define that risk a little bit better. And Claire, if they do have a recurrence, what's the um, sort of prognosis using either conservative management or repeat surgery? It's exactly the same as before. Okay. Um, so um, just because they were paralyzed once doesn't mean that they have to have surgery the next time and can be managed uh, conservatively and, and vice versa. The only thing I would say is if they've had um, a, 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 an incomplete recovery, especially if they were grade five, then um, those pre-existing neurological deficits are going to be uh, already still there. And it's going to mean that they... they um, they will still have those and to recover from the other injury. So uh, that might make it more, more difficult for them because they already have a weakness. Yeah. Um, great. You're, you're ever so popular. We're getting so many questions. I'll just um, take one more question. Um, I'll just pick one at random. Well, I, I can stay uh, for another 15 minutes if you want. But okay, yeah, we'll do a couple of that's yeah. okay. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's have a look. So we've got... Um, we've got my miniature Dashan has been struggling to walk for about a week with wobbly back legs. I believe he's on stage two of IVDD. He's having an MRI tomorrow. Would you recommend surgery at this stage? I would wait to see what the MRI shows. That will yeah. be the key test. It'll tell you one way or the other. Um, I suspect from what you say, though, that um, that uh, uh, surgery may well be uh, a likelihood if he's been struggling to walk for a week yeah um ian has said claire could you say something about fenestration benefits or evidence ah uh, ian i took the fenestration slide out um can uh, esme can you put it back to the picture of the surgery for me um yeah let me just get rid of me for a second so fenestration is where you make a window into the disc so looking at that cartoon there um, we have the uh, spinal cord and then the blue extruded disc material underneath it. And then underneath that, that double black line is the disc. So fenestration is just cutting into that disc and weakening the, the annulus on one side in the hope that the disc material will come out uh, that side. You also do remove a little bit of disc material in the fenestration procedure. But um, uh, that's the key. You remove a little bit of disc material in the actual procedure. You don't do anything about the disc compression underneath the spinal cord. It's, it's regarded as a prophylactic procedure rather than something to deal with compression. It, it, uh, in, a, in the sort of um, 1980s, uh, vets used to do fenestrations uh, rather than doing hemilaminectomies. And that's really because they weren't really routinely doing myelograms or, or, or definitely not MRIs. And so they just used to fenestrate every disc. And, um, and some of those dogs got better or some of them didn't. And that it's really just exactly the same as non-surgical management. It's whether or not the dog gets better with a great big lump of material under its spinal cord or not. So um, when we fenestrate, Many, um, very, very few vets will offer fenestration for management of a dog with, um, like uh, uh, the lady mentioned before, that's wobbling on the back legs. It's, it, and, and in fact, if you did, I'd question your, um, uh, the ethics of that because it's not going to address the spinal cord compression. Um, so the vast majority of, na of vets now will only um, uh, do fenestration as part of a hemilaminectomy. So they'll do a hemilaminectomy to re remove the compression of the spinal cord, and then they will fenestrate the other at-risk discs in the hope of reducing the chances of recurrence. But because the fenestration is not removing all of that disc material, I mean, you, you really cannot remove all of the material through that tiny hole. Um, uh, it, it, you only reduce the risk, you don't make it a guarantee. 
I've lost Esme now. She's coming back. I'm back. <laughs> Hello. Hi there. Um, excuse me being a bit slow on the technology. We're getting there. Um, great. So um, B has asked, um, I hope it's popping up. Um, Five-year-old Daxi has IVDD. She's always been active and fit and never allowed upstairs. She's never been overweight. Should she now be restricted from going upstairs or too much exercise for the rest of her life? Oh, that's the thing is that's the real crunch question because I guess we really don't know. My unproven policy is I try to get the dogs back up to the level of fitness that they were before because I think that um, there is very little evidence to say that restricting the dog for the rest of their life, uh, wrapping them up in cotton wool uh, virtually, uh, will reduce the rate of recurrence uh, because we can see recurrence uh, even with dogs completely restricted and as I've said before having the dog lose that core muscle strength is uh, or get fat um, is probably the greatest uh, risk and it doesn't take a, a lot of extra calories for a, for a dachshund to, to gain weight um, uh, they've only and they, they've only got to reduce their activity a little bit and for you to feed them the same amount and they will gain that weight relatively quickly so I, I what I try to, to to preach is try to be a bit sensible I mean uh, it's probably not a good idea to have your dachshund do fly ball uh, if they were doing that um, it's probably not a good idea to if they've had cervical disc disease to encourage a tug of war um, or uh, vigorously going like that with a with a toy, um, but I do try to get them back to a stage that they can go up uh, up steps um, and um, exercise in a reasonably controlled manner. Because mm -hmm. I tend to think um, if they're going to recur, they will recur. I have to uh, put a disclaimer in here, as you know, I've got a Daxi myself, so I'm uh, taking notes on all of this to make sure I'm being a good owner. Um, my question as well, sort of leading on from um, from this, is um, if they've had IVDD, are they more likely to get um, arthritis, so spondylosis or anything um, in the spine? Um, well, spondylosis is another subject entirely, um, and it is just a new bone formation uh, a, a, that occurs uh, bridging two vertebrae um, and it will occur if the uh, if the donut part of the disc is disrupted in any way and so spondylosis is just the body's response to disc um, degeneration and I think of it as, as a bit like uh, um, a stake put up against a wobbly tree um, uh, if I saw a wobbly tree, would I think the tree was abnormal? No. If I put a stake against it, would I think it was abnormal? No, I'd just be my response to protecting that tree. So that's all spondylosis is. It's interesting you ask about arthritis because although chondrodystrophic dogs are predisposed to disc disease, it seems that those genes for chondrodystrophy actually protect against uh, arthritis, which is why you can take a hip radiograph of a dachshund and go, oh my goodness me, those are loose. Um, but they not have um, not have arthritis, mm -hmm. um, so they can get away with loose hips because they don't um, have seem they seem to be protected against the getting the, the the secondary arthritis, which is what actually causes the pain in, in hip dysplasia. So the answer is no. Um, they do not appear to be more predisposed to arthritis, but of course chondrodystrophism actually gives you these how can I do it twisted little joints. Um, uh, twisted little joints, um, and that twisting of their uh, of their legs may predispose to arthritis in those joints, yeah. quite simply because of the abnormal forces on them. Yeah. Um, Christina um, says my dog has mild thoracolumbar disease, uh, disc protrusion. Sorry, he has been fecally incontinent for eighteen months. Is this related? Well, Christine, it depends on your dog. Is it a pug? Question mark. If it is a pug, then it's it's highly likely that this is constrictive myelopathy, which is a completely different uh, disorder. So the answer is no, you cannot get mild uh, fecal incontinence from mild thoracolumbar disc protrusions mm -hmm. because fecal incontinence really requires damage to the top part of the spinal cord. Um, that's where the tracks are. And so uh, fecal incontinence uh, either implies there's something wrong with the nerves that are directly going to the rectum, um, which uh, uh, could be 
um, at the lumbar sacral area, or there's something going on. And by far the most common cause of fecal incontinence that I see is pugs with constrictive myelopathy. Uh, and it's too big a subject to go into, um, but uh, you can Google it. Yeah. Um, Tanya, she says, how prone are the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels to IVDD? How would you manage pain if the dog is already re receiving medication for, I think she means syringe? Uh, yeah, she means Chiari malformation and syringomyelia, CMSM. Um, so, uh, well, the Cavalier is not as predisposed as uh, many smaller breeds, and that's because it has uh, proportional miniaturization, so the, the, the legs aren't overly short. Um, they, if they do get uh, intervertebral disc disease, it, um, it is more commonly, in my experience, in the neck, uh, and so this might be a dog which is typically over five years of age. So they tend to be much older when they get into vertebral disc disease and they have sudden onset uh, neck pain. Uh, really, the rules are very similar um, to, uh, to any other dog having into vertebral disc disease. Um, but if they're already on medication, they're already receiving, for example, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and the, and the gabapentinoids, then you will either have to increase that dose change the medication. So sometimes changing from one non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug to another can improve the pain. Um, it's, there's no, uh, in my experience, there's no one best non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, um, but switching them can sometimes help. So I would probably switch them to something else. I might change the gabapentinoid from gabapentin to pregabalin. I might give it more often. I might give a higher dose. Um, and in, in many instances, I probably would hospitalize that dog to give it pain relief that, that we can't give um, it, uh, at home. So the, the injectable drugs like the opioids. Uh, I'm also a, a big fan of, uh, of ketamine. Not for me, for the dogs. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, that is a very effective pain relief when given a very low, uh, low dose. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, we might also use paracetamol for dogs, obviously not cats, highly, highly, highly toxic in your cat. You'll kill your cat if you give it paracetamol. Um, uh, we will also use, use that. And we will also look at trying to, to use complementary techniques if we can, such as acupuncture and laser therapy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Charlotte um, has asked or talked about dogs that need catheterizing um, or expressing she's talking about urinary incontinence and issues there during covid this is difficult and distressing for the dogs any advice for owners facing these problems well it's a big problem because um, it, learning how to express a bladder is not easy um, i would say that it takes at least five days to learn how to do it uh, properly. And the trouble is that it's when you're trying to deal with a dog with a neurogenic bladder, it's, it's more tough. And in fact, uh, at Surrey University, one of the student projects is to design a model of how to teach uh, owners how and, and uh, other veterinary lay staff of how to express a bladder. And rather sadly, they were just due to test their model on us uh, and us vets when the COVID-19 lockdown occurred. And so our, our lovely veterinary students have made this lovely, uh, lovely model with pressure sensors, um, sensors, et cetera, uh, can't test it out. But that, the reason for the motivation for, um, for designing such a thing was because this is so difficult. And to be honest, I do not think you can do this without uh, veterinary support. Um, I, I really think, um, that you either need to have the dog hospitalized or that the dog needs to go to the vet um, every uh, day so that a veterinary nurse or um, a vet can uh, check your bladder expression and express it if, if necessary. These are, these are not techniques that can easily be learnt at, at home, I'm afraid. That's just, that's just the bottom line. Um, uh, we come across it all the time um, and uh, uh, we had it last week and in that instance, we, we have to uh, 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 adopt guidelines, put on PPE for all concerned uh, and, and help the, the owner learn how to do how to do it. Yeah, Absolutely. it's really tough, really, really mm -hmm. tough. Um, 
So let's have a look what else we've got here. Barbara, um, my 15 year old girl, no soup, no specific breed, stops sitting and lying down like she always did. I know her back, her leg back muscles are deteriorating, but could it be due to something else? She had a radiograph one year and a half when everything was okay, but at that time she did still sit. She's doing acupuncture. I think that's really tricky, isn't it? It could be so many things. Um, um, Really, I suppose if she's dragging her legs, then it could be something called degenerative myelopathy, which is a disease we see in older breed dogs. But typically that um, uh, would come on before 15 years of age. So in German Shepherds, Cavaliers, um, Chesapeake Bay Retrievers, Rough Collies, thinking of a few other breeds, um, Wirehead Fox Terriers, um, Tibetan Terriers that will come on at about eight years of age and be progressive. So if they manage to get to 15, it's probably not that. I think that this sounds like multiple comorbidities, I would suggest, is what I would say. You're probably dealing with osteoarthritis of several joints, lumbar sacral disease, um, lots, lots of things. Uh, and this would be the ideal um, dog to look at uh, multiple uh, therapy complementary therapy and drug therapy to improve mobility but it's very difficult to do that without getting a, a specific uh, diagnosis of, of some kind yeah yeah i'd agree with that um there's a question again from charlotte about wheelchairs so when do you advise wheelchairs we should uh, we advise owners that they should wait at least six months post ivdd surgical or conservative management and no mobility or chance of recovering when they're uh, recovering their independence we loan equipment to hundreds of dachshunds well that's a tri tricky question because the first time i used a dog cart um was uh when i was a resident which was many many years ago and it was in a doberman um and basically this 40 kilogram doberman was doing my back in because it was paraplegic after um a spinal cord injury and uh, taking a long time to recover. And it was at the hospital, the, the hospital I was in at the moment, it was the Royal Veterinary College. And uh, somebody donated their German Shepherd's uh, trolley after, um, after the dog died. And um, I put the Stoberman in it and big rookie mistake, I didn't put a lead on the front. <laughs> and there was this Falwellian image of me, you can imagine, of a Doberman in a cart, hurtling off across the fields behind the Royal Veterinary College with me in hot pursuit. Um, and I literally had to remove that Doberman from a bush uh, where he chased a rabbit. Uh, and that really, uh, and then the next day he hurled his cart sideways like this up against a post because he thought he could, he could cock his leg. So I think there are some instances where an animal is taking a very long time to recover, where you can use a cart as part of their physiotherapy to give them a better quality of life because that Doberman turned a corner when I was no longer holding him up with a harness. Yeah. And so I will say if the dog is taking a very long time that they can go in a cart for part of their walk um, yeah. and, uh, and that will allow them a little bit of freedom. Uh, just, just if you had such a problem and somebody wanted to take you for a day out, should we say, to, to Wisley Gardens, uh, uh, Gardens or something like that? Would you walk around all of that big property when you were recovering from your spinal surgery? No, you would not. You would ask for one of their wheelchairs for you to be pushed around in. Yeah. So I think a similar sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so, and I also think if the dog is not going to walk again, why wait till six months? Um, so, but I also agree with you that you have to use it or lose it. Uh, and, and if you pop that dog in that, in that trolley too early, yeah. then they'll think, oh, well, this is great. I don't actually need to have four legs. So off I go. Um, yeah. so I think you really have to look at the individual dog and not make a, a, a written rule. Yeah. I have a couple of, um, pug myelopathy dogs that I treat with acupuncture and we mm -hmm. use the cart for them just to literally get them out of the house and it actually gets them to move those back legs because they can't hold themselves up so in certain yeah, cases they can I, be useful but I think in the pug myelopathy the constrictive myelopathy if they if um that the cart actually can help in that instance so yeah. in that problem you have an issue where the dog congenitally doesn't have joints uh between their vertebrae um and the more they're wobbling about from side to side the more yeah. they're stressing that spinal cord and um, and uh, so in those instances, carts are definitely the best option for them. 
uh, because it will allow them mobility because uh, really once they have um, uh, have lost the use of their their back legs it's really unlikely to come back even with surgery and I think we'll take the last question. Um, Catherine said her six-year-old Cavi had slipped two years ago, rest improved, but she still lays down after running in the park, stretches her back legs out like a frog. Would, you, would she be feeling discomfort? I think for a dog to lie with their legs out like a frog suggests they're quite comfortable, actually. So most dogs that lie in that position actually don't have spinal pain. Um, uh, so, um, I would say probably not, uh, yeah. if that was the problem. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, I think that's it. Thank brilliant. you Claire, so much. This has been absolutely brilliant. I've learned loads. I'm sure everybody else watching has as well. And, um, it's been great to go through all of the questions with you. Um, we're desperately, uh, wanting you to come back to do maybe wobblers or, um, lumbar sacral disease or, or all of the above. Um, so we'll look forward to that if that's okay with you. Um, but thank you again for your time. You're welcome. Welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.